When does speed matter? Well, certainly when you're a racehorse or a jockey, because if you can get around the track faster than the competition, you win the race and you get the prize money. Well, it's really the same in business. If you can get the job done faster than the competition, you win the deal and you get the money. So speed is not only important in horse racing, it's also important in business computing. And speed in computing these days means a 486 PC. How fast is the 486 and is it worth betting on? We'll answer those questions and more as we look at the 486 option on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Datastorm Technologies, setting the standard in PC communications through the development of award-winning software such as Procom Plus, combining power, ease of use, and affordability to become the best-selling communication software in the world. And by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail-order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is John Wharton, a columnist for the trade publication Microprocessor Report. Now, we're dealing with microprocessors here, John. Mm -hmm. We have two identical computer setups, except I have a 386 CPU over here. You have a 486 CPU over here, and I want to see what difference that really makes. We have an AutoCAD demo up here, so when I say ready, get, set, go, we're going to start this demo at the same time and All see right. what happens. Ready, get, set, go. Well, it's pretty clear your 486 beat mine on that first slide. Let's mm -hmm. wait to see it draw one more slide and see what the difference is. Well, boom. I mean, the 486 is done. Bigger. This hasn't even started yet. That's right. All right. Who needs the power of a 486, John? Who needs the power? Uh, Computer-aided design applications like this, mm -hmm. uh, database servers, virtual reality systems, multimedia authoring. These are examples of power user applications where people just are never happy with the performance they have. All right. We're all not power users. I mean, I'm the average guy running a business using spreadsheets, word processors. For me, does the 486 matter? The rest of us can benefit from the 486 speed as well. If you're doing a word processing program, it might be nice to have the spell checking go on in the background yeah. so you don't have to stop and do that mm -hmm. later. If you're in the midst of a spread Sheet, it would be good if your computer might call in automatically and pick up electronic mail okay. from a server of some sort. All right, well, as John mentioned, one power hungry application is a database server on a network. And as we saw with our little AutoCAD demo here, a 486 CPU can make a big difference. We're going to see what that difference means now on an SQL server. When this organization was originally conceived in 1983, it would have taken a mainframe to do what we're doing now on the 486s. Matt Costello is systems administrator at the Center for Money and Politics, a research organization in Washington whose clients are political candidates and news organizations. They maintain a three gigabyte database of people who give money to federal candidates. They just switch to ALR 486 computers, which run under OS2 and are connected to a Gupta SQL server. Well, the 486 in our implementation has allowed us to expand the database uh, back a number of years so that we've almost doubled it in size since going to a 486 and the processing speed has you know remained uh, about the same or you know improved a little bit. With the power of the 486 Costello can access the SQL database using plain English language queries. The server finds the data and then determines the best path for sending it back to the client terminals. The power and the speed of the 486 means getting clients' answers in minutes rather than days. I did uh, a study for a client, a vote correlation study, and uh, going back to 1985, and she did it manually using paper printouts from the FEC going back earlier than that. And it took me 10 or 15 minutes to complete on the computer, and it took her three days to do the earlier data manually. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Sometimes having a 486 CPU can be like having a Porsche on a crowded freeway. The car or the chip can only go as fast as the supporting system architecture. Here to show us the importance of what you put around your 486 is Charlie Sauer of Dell Computer. And back with us, John Wharton of Microprocessor Report. 
John, we've seen a tremendous increase in processor speed over the last 10 years or so. What's the underlying technology that's allowed us to get such faster chips, faster clock speed, faster CPUs? It's really a combination of factors. The basic clock frequency has gone up by about a factor of 10 in the last 10 years. The number of clock cycles required to complete each instruction has fallen by a factor of 5 on mm -hmm. average. And you have more powerful instructions now that can process 32 bits of data instead of 8 or 16 bits. All told, it's about a, 50, a factor of 50 overall improvement versus the processors of 10 years ago. Right, but how about the point I was just making before? What's going on around that processor, though? The, the, the I.O., the bus problem, is still pretty slow, isn't it? That is the problem. Uh, since the days of the AT, the bus really hasn't changed right. that much. So you may have some slight improvement, but you're still reaching a bottleneck. It's a little bit, uh, one analogy might be the airline industry. If uh, airplanes were 50 times faster than they used to be, you would be able to fly from Los Angeles to New York in maybe 10 minutes. That wouldn't be quite as advantageous, though, if it still took an hour for you to get your luggage off the plane at the other end. That's the bus uh, jam up right The bus there. is like the conveyor belt that yeah, brings exactly. the luggage on and off the plane. All right, well, let's see how we solve that over here at Dell. First of all, describe the hardware setup you've got here, Charlie. Okay, these are both 50 megahertz 46 ESA machines. Okay. They're identical except for the graphics subsystem. Okay, and we do have different displays here, which is part of the The, the displays graphics. are different because yeah. of the graphics subsystem. The one on the right has higher resolution, so we have a high, larger screen. Okay, but inside, two identical CPUs, 50 megahertz, 486. Inside, right? they're identical All CPUs. Right, now, you're focusing on the graphics part of the speed problem here, and tell us about that and show us what's going on with these boards here. Okay, in a traditional PC, the processor connects to the memory. This is an add-in processor card. Here's the processor. This connects to the memory bus right. and on out to the I.O. bus. Right. The graphics is way out on the I.O. bus, and the processor sends commands out to the I.O. So bus to get graphics out, done. Right. And, it's, and it's a long path. It's a narrow path. It's a bottleneck, both for the program okay. and for the program. And this is what we would be seeing in the machine over here. Is that That's correct? That's what we're seeing in the okay. machine. What's the, the difference in that board? This has processor direct graphics. Instead of going out to the I.O. bus for graphics, we go straight over to this video memory right here, and this is a, a large amount of video mm -hmm. memory to give us high resolution right. and a large number of colors, and then on out to the monitor directly. And that's the board that's in the machine that's, that's the next board to you. That's now in now the show us right. what that means to me if I'm running an application. Okay, I'm going to bring up an Excel spreadsheet on both machines. Okay, same spreadsheet. Same spreadsheet. And what are you going to ask it to do? It's going to merge two spreadsheets and uh, then graph numbers from each of those spreadsheets. The one on the left uh, actually started earlier, but the one on the right will finish earlier. And they'll both show the times at the end when okay, they're done. So we're merging two spreadsheets and then graphing the results That's of, correct. The, of the composite spreadsheet. And they're both doing the same thing. Both what, what should we expect here in terms of performance difference? The right one will be about twice as fast. At okay, now done, the right one's already in, into the graphics, and this one is still working on the spreadsheet. We can see that already. That's correct. Now, this hasn't even begun getting to the graphics part of this task. The graphics will actually look about the same speed uh, when the graphics are being done. What really is being faster is showing the spreadsheet on the screen. That's hmm. what's really catching up uh, the right one ahead. All right, of so we're done now over on the right, and it took how long to say? 29 seconds. And that job is complete, and we're just really gotten into the graphics part of the problem over here. Again, same CPU, same clock speed, everything same, except the difference in how you're processing the graphics. Everything's the same but the graphics. Now, why did this guy start again there? Oh, I right. forgot to hit the escape key to stop. Doing it, it again? It's going to keep It's going to do it twice in the time it it's takes to do get it twice in the Probably. time. Probably. Well, as a matter of fact, it looks like it's caught up sort of lapping the computer over here. Yeah, right? it, it, it is going to lap the one over there. Okay, so the one on the left should be done momentarily. And it is, and it took, what, one minute, seven seconds compared to 30 seconds over there. seconds over there. So just by making that one improvement in the graphics, you were able to Doubles. double double the performance over there. And so this one's done too yeah. now. All right, now you have another an animation demonstration. If you right. can get that loaded up for us, too, so we can see what the difference really is there also. While he's doing that, John, uh, it seems to me we're tugging in two different directions. The more we integrate, the more we shove all that stuff onto that one place, mm -hmm. we're moving in the opposite direction of another goal, which is modularity, easy upgradability, and so on, aren't we? Um, yes and no. We are... Uh, putting more of the power into the processor so there's less need of boards in the outside world. Mm -hmm. I, what I expect to happen in the future is that the upgrades will tend to take place on the processor board itself. You may replace chips. You may have yeah, a variety yeah, of different yeah. chips of different performance ratings. The reason you would still need add-in boards would be to customize your system for some special application, changing from an uh, mm -hmm. Ethernet controller yeah. to a, uh, a um, 
the fiber optic network, for instance. Yeah, while Charlie finishes getting the animation demo up there, explain, we're talking really about the 486 primarily on this show, and what makes the 486 the 486? How is it different from the 386, Jeff? Again, it's, a ma it's several different factors. The 386 had a budget of about 350,000 transistors to work with. Mm -hmm. The 486 has 1.2 million. That's four oh, times as many. Okay. What that allows is a large amount of memory to be put on board the processor. Yeah. It allows certain functional units to be replicated. Instead of having to compute addresses one step at a time, you can compute the addresses all yeah, at once. Yeah. Uh, one thing the 486 does is a lot of speculative execution. It may not know what has to come next, but it mm. does it anyway, just in case that has yeah, to be done. Yeah. Okay, Charlie, how are we doing over here? Okay, the animation is going on the left, and it's going pretty well. The animation on the right is about to start, and you'll see it's about twice as fast. It's just zooming along. Right, right. And once again, everything's the same except for everything's the same except for the, the graphics, graphics over there. And this, but this one's able to go twice as fast as a result of the graphics difference. Now, is this? Are you selling the board? Is this simply a new Dell computer that you're selling? What's the product? These systems are designed to have replaceable processor cards, uh -huh. and so uh, right now we're selling the machine with this card and other cards. We're not yet selling this card. Uh -huh. This is a prototype, but okay. in the spring we'll be you know, offering a machine with this card as well. Yeah. Well, these little road running here guys certainly uh, show us the <laughs> difference. One last question, John. What's what's next? I know we're hearing about the P5 now. I mean, how far can you push the, the, the speed question? Well, people tend to look just one generation ahead at a time. Yeah. The P5 is likely to be announced uh, sometime later this year. Mm -hmm. um, what I would expect to see in that is somewhere between 3 and 4 million transistors in mm -hmm. the budget. What that allows is perhaps twice as large a cache, um, redu perhaps reducing the number of cycles per instruction closer to one on average. Yeah. Uh, it might even be possible in the P5 to execute several instructions in parallel. Mm. Uh, overall improving in performance by another factor of four, perhaps. Well, hopefully you find out more about that soon. Gentlemen, thank you very much. All right, suppose you love the idea of a 50 megahertz 486, but you are also a laptop freak. Is there a machine for you? Yes. Virtual reality is one of those applications that can never get enough speed. So when Tom Cool of the Sense8 Corporation goes around showing off his new virtual reality product called World Toolkit, he needs all the power he can get. The 486 50 megahertz chip has really made this technology practical. Uh, prior to the 486 50 megahertz uh, processor, the frame rate or the number of times that the computer can update the scene just really wasn't sufficient. We need about 12 frames per second. And the 486 50 megahertz uh, processor has made that become a reality. This Dolch computer is currently the only 50 megahertz 486 portable, but at 18 pounds, it's not quite a laptop, and it's not the kind of computer Tom Cool would use on an airplane. It is meant to be operated uh, when he arrives, wherever he'll, he'll go, uh, off-site, to have all the power. Therefore, these kind of, these kind of machines are not uh, battery-operated, uh, have no need for that, and therefore uh, there was no need to uh, maximize battery life we have maximized performance. The Dolch 48650E does pack performance with a 120 megabyte hard drive, VGA display, and four expansion slots. But such power has a price, in this case, about $9,000. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Okay, nothing is fast enough for you. You bought your new 486 computer, but you still want more. Well, thanks to those new little vacancy signs inside your computer, you can now upgrade to get even more speed. Here to show us how are Dennis Carter of Intel, and also with us, Bob Kutnick of Amcle Systems. All right, Dennis, let me ask you, first of all, we're doing the show about the 486. Some people are still upgrading to the 386. Andrew Grove, CEO of Intel, spoke a couple of weeks ago, and he said, well, the 386, that's for under $1,000 entry-level home computers. The 486 is for small businesses, but it's really all the P5, the new processor that's coming, that's the serious chip. Is this all history already, 386 and 486? Well, we're definitely seeing a movement of 486 becoming the standard in business applications. Mm -hmm. And there is no question that 386s are becoming ever increasingly cheaper and uh, moving down scale. Right. The P5 is something that Intel will be introducing later this year, uh -huh. and so isn't a player in that yet. This is kind of a, a normal phenomenon that you see of the, of right. the spiral, where um, Intel comes out with a new processor that brings ever more power, 
and the software guys all race to use that, mm -hmm. and uh, pretty soon you find that the power isn't quite enough to do right. everything the software guys want to do, and so the cycle goes right. on. All right, Bob, that's what I want to talk to you about. The cycle goes on. Everybody says, geez, I don't want to buy a machine because tomorrow there'll be something better and tomorrow will be something. So you make an investment in hardware, and you don't want to junk it all to buy a new 486 machine or to up your clock speed or whatever. You guys at Amcly are focusing on the upgradability problem, I take it. And tell me what your approach is here in the, in the, in the box you have in well, front of us. We've actually focused on modular upgradability, which not only includes upgrading the processor, but even includes upgrading such things as drives. We've created something called a power drive pack, uh -huh. and what that does is by simply pushing a button, the uh -huh. whole set of drives, power supply, and everything comes out of the machine. Now, why would you want to do that? It allows you to upgrade drives. It also has a feature if something goes wrong, for example, with the electronics in a machine, mm -hmm. And this is now where all your information is stored at the company. You can easily move it to another machine in uh -huh, a matter of minutes uh -huh. versus waiting for a service attendant to come hours down right. the road and move drives in and out and do those things. Okay. Now, Bob, you also have an innovative approach to BIOS update. How are you handling that at, uh, with the Amclean machine? Well, a long time ago, we had a situation where if BIOS ever changed, what that required was changing one of these chips in here right. or both of those chips. What we've done is we've gone to a part that's called a flash part, which is an electronically programmable mm -hmm. part. That part allows us to upgrade the BIOS using a diskette. So what happens is when you want to upgrade your BIOS, you stick in a floppy disk into the machine. You actually push a button so that you don't run into any viruses or anything mm -hmm. like that. And that actually allows you to reload the BIOS right into the so machine. So you don't have to risk pulling the chip out and squeezing another exactly. one. Exactly. No bent pins, no software. hurt fingers. Right. It's all software. Okay, now finally, I've got a 386. Let's say uh, this has a 386 board in it right now. Correct. This is now a 386 33 okay. or 25 machine. I'm sorry. And I want a 486 What's machine. This? What do I do with this amp? That's actually done as simple as pulling the card out of the machine and then replacing the card within the machine by, by simply sliding this card into the machine, pushing down. We've now installed a 486, and this is now a full speed. 48633 machine, and th this card can actually be done with 48650s, it can uh -huh, be done with uh -huh. 46SXs, gives you the whole realm, yeah. and actually even allows us to upgrade within this card itself. Mm -hmm. And now, how hard is it to get that, that power uh, disk drive unit back into this? Power machine? drive pack is very simple. We actually just pick it up, line up the tabs in the back, push it down. Well. Wow. That's pretty good. All right, Dennis, let's turn to you. And we've all seen these great commercials with this vacancy slot lighting up inside these computers. And we've been trying to figure out what we're going to put in there. And I guess you're coming out now with one of the first products that you can actually use to upgrade your 486 PC, right? That's correct. We've, we've looked at the problem from, from the CPU point of view. And one thing, we've, one thing that we've heard back from uh, the community in upgrades is that what people would really like is some kind of midlife kicker. Mm -hmm. So that as their systems spiral up this, uh, this ever-increasing curve of mm -hmm. wanting more power, to run the software, that during somewhere in the midlife of the machine, they can kind of upgrade it to bring it back up to the speed of the of the new machines that that they, they would be comparable to that. So uh, we've used a speed doubling technique, and we have a product uh, that we will be introducing in the next uh, couple of months uh -huh. that we call Overdrive that fits in that socket that you described right. that the vacancy signs point okay, at. Okay, and what does Overdrive do for me? Well, Overdrive is is a 486. It fits in uh, the empty socket and it basically allows your CPU to run twice as fast as it did before. Okay, twice as fast meaning from what to what? Well, if you had a 20 megahertz uh -huh. system, for example, uh, an Overdrive processor runs at 40 megahertz internally yet still uh -huh. maintains the 20 megahertz external. Uh, signal. So your system bas basically gets twice the CPU right. performance. I mean, even if I'm at 33, say, I... you then would have an overdrive uh -huh. that went at 66. Okay, can you show us how this would actually work here? Can we do something sure. and then upgrade the machine and then do the same thing again? Correct. Um, we have a demo here. Now, you double the CPU performance, and we tried to put together a demonstration that would show you how you normally use a machine in a business application so you could see what kind of performance you would get, what you would actually see. So we're going to run you through this application. Um, the application is uh, mimicking a situation where you would be uh, writing a report. Okay. And so we take you into Windows and we start with WinWord. We're scrolling through a report that, that presumably you've already written. We're going out to a spreadsheet, getting some data, uh, affixing it to the report. Okay. So we're in the usual sort of presentation, word processor, spreadsheet, the slides or whatever? Right. Okay. Um, you can see here we're generating some graphs, some mm -hmm. charts that we'll put into the report from the, uh, the Excel data. 
when we get that done, we'll go through the uh, always word processing stage, where, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, the uh, spell check right, stage, right. where you go through and make sure all your spelling mm -hmm. is correct. Right. And um, again, what we're trying to show is uh, an application that, that does both di disk accesses right. as well as the CPU. So this thing is running on its own, but I mean, this is a real world application. This is a real world application. Uh, you just sort of macroed it and it's running through all these steps. Exactly. So we can see how long it takes for it to do this right now That's correct. in its current mode. Which is what? This is 486, what? This is a 48620. Okay, 48620. This is a 46SX20. Got it. And we'll measure the elapsed time. We'll then let you do the upgrade, okay. and we'll measure the elapsed time again, and you can see what kind of performance gain you would get. Uh, we're now going through a character recognition uh, program. Mm -hmm. It's OmniPage, and what, what this program is doing is we're assuming that you want to scan in a document to affix to your report. And when you do that, you scan it in in graphics format. Right. Uh, it, you then need to go through and do uh, uh, character recognition to turn it in into text format so that you can put it back in the word processor. This turns out to be a fairly CPU intensive part of the application. You can see the uh, character recognition actually going through in blocks. Right. And after we've done the upgrade, you'll be able to see that visibly happen much faster. Okay, so we're cranking through a fair amount of work here, and it's Correct. done. And we're done. And, and you see the elapsed time. 106 seconds, let's say, to do seconds. all that work. We'll shut down Windows. There we go. Okay. So you're going to show me how to do this uh, no. overdrive upgrade? Correct. Thank you for shutting the machine off. Yes. <laughs> now, if you okay. could ground yourself here, where we okay. do the uh, upgrade. All right, so this yes. is the chip that's going to double Correct. my speed. And just stick it in. Just stick it in. It has a key pin in it so I see that the it, orientation. Yeah. Uh, I just it just sort of falls right falls in. Falls right in it. Okay. There you go. That's it. I've just upgraded the machine. You've just upgraded the machine. We'll turn back on the system. And we're gonna do the same thing again. We'll do the same thing again. And I should be running at forty megahertz. Correct. Okay. Now, as the machine comes up, we have to. Uh, we have to go back through the startup phase as okay. it goes in the window. Well, while doing, let me ask you. I mean, we talked. You said this was a zero insertion force system. Socket, yes. Yeah, because I sort of dropped it in there. I didn't have to squeeze those pins in. Correct. There, there are several uh, sockets that that make the insertion process very simple. This one is called a zero insertion force socket, as as we've said, yeah. and it it is incredibly simple to put in and also to extract. Well, that's one. So I just lift that lever and pull it out if I want to. Correct. Okay. So we're pulling up the same demo now? That's correct. And we'll go through it one more time. And now theoretically, what should happen here in terms of speed performance? Theoretically, um, you'll see an improvement of something between 50 and 70%. Mm -hmm. The CPU intensive part will be running twice as fast. The part that uh, accesses disks or whatever will slow that down okay. on average. All right, can we run this? Certainly. So we push up two so again. We're going to do the we're, same demo. We're back off again. Okay, and it'll run the same bit, and it'll clock itself and tell us correct. Tell us what's the going. So let me ask you, while we're waiting for this to run through, uh, I mean, we've seen before. I mean, CAD is a is a really power hungry, speed hungry yes. application. SQL servers and so on. We're just doing kind of routine stuff here: spreadsheet, word processor. So, I mean, is that an important arena in which I should care about this speed? Does it matter enough? To oh, me? it certainly is because um, first of all, the graphics, which has been one of the things you've talked about in the show, the graphics. Um, always take more uh, power from the CPU, steel CPU cycles to do them, and so the more powerful the CPU is, the, the faster the perceived graphics are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, pro when you open several windows, uh, you're stealing a lot of CPU That's cycles. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there actually are a lot of things that you think of as mundane applications that really are pretty power hungry. Mm -hmm. Especially working in this environment. Correct. Now you can see we're in the application. We're already into here. the scan yeah, part. Yeah, we're in the scan part. So it's going much faster, and you can visibly see the scans Okay, so we were 106 seconds before. Correct. Uh, about, what, a minute 40 or something like that, a minute 46. Right. And we're guessing this should take, what, about half as much time? Yeah, it'll probably take around 60 or 65 seconds. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we're getting to the... Uh, so we are. Okay. So 106, 65, that's pretty good savings. Yeah, that's about uh, 60, 65 percent. Yeah. And, and when do you expect to have the, uh, the overdrive? Uh, we'll be announcing this product within the next couple of months. Okay, you've helped us appreciate the power of speed and upgradability. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, that's our show on the 486. Dennis, I hope we'll be back to do a P5 or 586 show at some point. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News on Random Access.
In the random access file this week, March 6th has come and gone, and one research firm says 15% of all end users were affected by the Michelangelo virus. Most users fortunately located and zapped the virus before it did any harm. Michelangelo was widely distributed and found its way onto leading edge PCs, Intel's Landspool print server utility, and several other commercial products. There were reports of the virus on PCs on Capitol Hill, though not on the mainframe which serves Congress. There were even reports of Michelangelo as far away as Western Australia. Intel has just announced a new version of its 486 chip called the 486DX2. This next generation chip incorporates the speed doubler technology used in the overdrive add-in chip. Several PC vendors, including Compaq, AT&T, NCR, Gateway, and Zeos, have already announced new models that will use the 486DX2. Digital Equipment Corporation is touting its next-generation CPU called the Alpha Chip. It's a 64-bit RISC-based processor that runs at 150 megahertz. Well, Hyundai says it has become the first PC maker to offer a lifetime warranty on its computers. The warranty covers the motherboard, video card, floppy drive, and keyboard. Toshiba has announced further price cuts on its notebook computers. The price on the popular 2200SX is being cut 25 percent, down to $29.99, for the 40 megabyte version. The best selling software product for the PC last week was Stacker. Tax cut dropped to number four and TurboTax to number five. No other surprises in the rest of the top ten. Finally, the Hungarian National Bank reports that it found a virus in its computer system in Budapest. But this virus, unlike the deadly Michelangelo, simply caused the bank's computers to start playing music. There was no loss in data. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Datastorm Technologies, setting the standard in PC communications through the development of award-winning software such as Procom Plus, combining power, ease of use, and affordability to become the best-selling communication software in the world. And by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail-order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated, plus background information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a subscription to the newsletter, call 1 800 366 9484 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. 